Are we okay, Anita? Or let's go. Okay. Yep, you're ready to go. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to declare the meeting open. It's uh, 8.31. Welcome along to the audit committee meeting for the Friday the 19th of June. Um, just like to uh, start by mentioning that, um, advising you that the meeting is being streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and recordings also being published to the internet. Um, please note that um, an audio and vis visual recording is being taken of the meeting and it means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published uh, publicly by the council, including transferred outside of Australia. Uh, and then in terms of protocols, um, suggest that you mute yourself if you can when you're not speaking, but try and unmute yourself when you are speaking. Um, and be helpful if you could um, raise your hand if you want to speak uh, and also just in front of your face. Uh, and also when it comes to voting for the members, if they can raise their hands and obviously um, when they're putting any motions as well. So um, we'll do our best. It's always a bit clunky, but we'll get there. Um, the first item of business is a confirmation of, of the minutes from the 1st of May. Um, we, uh, the the uh, meeting was held on 1st of May. Uh, take them as read, but is, are there any comments? Otherwise, if I have someone move that we um, confirm the thanks, Ross. You're um, moving. Seconded by Paula. All in favour? Kerry, thank you. See your hand, Alex. Uh, also, I should mention I did get a message from the Lord Mayor uh, about quarter past eight saying that she might be around 15 minutes late for the meeting. We do have a quorum. Uh, we expect that the Lord Mayor will join us very soon. Um, that might even be her signing in now. Also, want to um, acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people, the Adelaide Plains, and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. So um, good morning, Sandy, you've joined us. Thank you. Uh, we'll move along. We've got... Um, we do have three presentations and then a workshop this morning. Um, our first presentation is brought to us by Jodie Canane from the Adelaide Central Market Authority. Hi Jodie, I think we used to work together about 27 years ago, but I won't mention how long. So welcome along, <laughs> if you can unmute yourself. Um, and I think you're sharing a screen, so thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Morning. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and present at the audit committee this morning. Um, just seeing if I can control the screen to move through the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got it now. Thank you. Um, so Adelaide Central Market Authority, as you're probably aware, is a subsidiary of council under section 42 and we're governed by a charter. Um, comprising of a and a board comprising of a of a chairperson and, and six board members, which includes a council member, which currently is a deputy lord mayor and a, a trader representative. Um, so we do have some changes coming up with our board soon. Um, we've got four replacement directors commencing at ACMA from the first of August, including the new chair, which was announced last week, being Theo Maris. So a little bit of change with our board coming up uh, later this year. So we're operating in our current four year strategic plan. We have an annual business plan, which we presented at council next week. Um, the, the management team that runs the Adelaide Central Market uh, includes seven operational uh, members. Uh, we've got almost 6,000 uh, square metres of retail space, 72 traders, 1,000 car parks that we also look after. So our main um, sources of revenue are through rent and the U Park car park. Um, and we have almost 9 million uh, visitors that come through. So that's just a little bit of a brief overview as to um, ACMA. Not sure if I can keep moving through. Um, our financials and risks, well, we have a risk register that's later on in the slide. Uh, it's formally 
uh, reviewed biennially with the um, Finance Audit and uh, Risk Committee uh, on a biannual basis and also goes to the board. Um, like I mentioned, we look after the operations of the car park and the market floor. Uh, and we have some marketing funds which come from a contribution from tenants through the lease arrangements. So we have financial reports that are presented to the board every month, um, an annual report uh, and an AGM each year in October. And we need to comply uh, with the Retail and Commercial, Commercial Leasing Act for our marketing fund. Just needing three more slides. Which I seems to have lost. <laughs> whether you can help me, Anita. I don't know where my preso has gone. I'll just try and reload it for you. No, just while you're reloading, um, there, there are some slides in here um, about our highlights for 1920, which I won't go through in detail. They are really just in there to, to give an opportunity to show some of the things that the central market has been doing in 19. 1920. All the work that we do is uh, based on our strategic plan, which comes under the four main pillars of customers, traders, uh, business, and also the precinct. So as you know, we aren't just a retail space, um, but the Adelaide Central Market plays a really important role in uh, the connection and enrichment of the, of the community. So why are we waiting for the slides? I'll, <laughs> I'll keep talking. Um, so yeah, customers obviously a significant um, focus. We did commence a Sunday trade trial at the beginning of the year um, before COVID commenced um, and we're planning on reintroducing uh, Sunday trade later on in the year. Um, We've also uh, work uh, very closely with our traders. It's not a normal landlord lessee sort of relationship, we definitely work together to get the uh, best outcome for the market. Looks like part of my slide is back, but perhaps a weird looking part of it. And Is that working for you, JD? No, oh, is it? Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. It just looks different on mine, that's all. Um, yeah, so that was just talking about our objectives and purpose. There are four strategic pillars. Um, just have some information on these slides, which I won't go through in detail given the timing for today, but just some information about our customers, our traders. Um, our business, including the um, completion of $3.4 million worth of capital works in 1920. Uh, so it was fantastic for the first time to get some cool air running through the market uh, for summer, uh, which was definitely an expectation of the, the community to come into it. Can we make it larger, the screen size larger? Is it possible? <laughs> oh, I could. Is that what yours looks like? Okay, it looked, mine's looking different on my screen compared to what you can see for some reason. So um, we'll just bear with me. Um, so working through our precinct um, for the first time this year, we've also become 100% um, diversion from landfill, which was a fantastic achievement. We've got a bio separator um, which separates our, our organic waste and in, uh, the last few months, we've been able to achieve 100% um, diversion from, from landfill, which has been um, a really big win. So moving on to our strategic risk register. So this register is reviewed, like I said, biannually with both our finance audit and risk committee um, and also our board. Uh, the main change obviously in this year is the fact that we've added uh, the impact of COVID. Um, 
and basically well the slides coming up actually talk further about COVID so I won't go into those details at the moment but this report obviously highlights our main strategic risks so um, at the moment we're working through with COVID um, we really need to make sure that the central market remains relevant uh, so making sure that we continue to attract more people uh, into the market as we all know uh, there's uh, significant competition being introduced, particularly in the uh, supermarket uh, space in, in recent years, and the Adelaide Central Market needs to continue to yeah, develop. Uh, we need to, uh, one of our other strategic risks is stakeholder relationships, um, the impact of Adelaide Central Market uh, with the, the upcoming market arcade redevelopment. Obviously, this is a, a really significant opportunity and a, a wonderful development that's going to um, lead the precinct um, in the next 50 years. Um, but in the short term, we do have to be aware of the fact that it will have an impact on the actual market, um, which is why it's on the register to make sure that we continue to address the, the um, operational and strategic issues in the short term that will be uh, caused by the construction. Jody, we've lost the register. I don't, um, I'm not sure what you're saying, but we've lost the register. I think my computer has a mind of its own at the moment. Got Joe next to me. Is that what it looks like to you? Yeah. Okay. Different things, but we'll get there. Um, we need to ensure, obviously, we have good governance. Being a subsidiary, we do um, run uh, the corporate governments and then reach out to to City of Adelaide um, to help support um, some of the um, governance items, and uh, we make sure that we comply with our charter and head lease. Has anyone got any questions on the strategic risk register? Can I ask who's who's are the independent members on the audit committee? Who are they? Yeah, uh, David Papa. Right, yes. yes. He's been on the um, committee uh, for uh, several years, um, and we uh, his term is expiring in September. Um, so we're looking at uh, taking on another external member um, and then having two independent external members on that FARC committee. Thank you. Yeah, right. Sorry, I'm just looking at Joe's screen because mine actually looks different. Um, okay, so moving on to COVID. Uh, so this has obviously been a, a, a challenging space, but the, the fantastic news is that Adelaide Central Market has been able to trade um, throughout the whole entire period of COVID. Um, and the traders have remained open and training. So as the initial response for, for COVID, we established a, a COVID working group, um, which from the beginning of April started week, meeting weekly. Um, there's four directors from the ACMA board and myself on that working group, um, just to make sure that we were continuing to make um, quick and uh, relevant uh, operational decisions on the business as we know the landscape was changing quite quickly, uh, particularly in the beginning and just making sure that we were staying on top of it. Um, we have a COVID management report that goes monthly to the ACMA board meeting and it summarises all the actions that ACMA has taken. I haven't put that in the pack today, it's now uh, probably about 160 pages um, capturing all the, all the um, operational actions that have been taken at the market in this time. Our strategic risk register has been updated. Um, City of Adelaide were able to pay. I don't know why it's moving. The City of Adelaide um, were fantastic in providing uh, rent relief for the traders from the 1st of April to 30th of June. And that really was the uh, 
saviour, I guess, to, to make sure that those traders in really tough trading conditions were able to, to stay open and continue trading. So communications have been extremely important throughout this time. Um, we've had uh, a lot of communication with our traders. Most of them, as you know, would uh, small owner operated businesses and rely on the authority to help support them with um, providing relevant information. So from the 4th of March, um, when COVID became <laughs> significant, since then we've uh, issued 31 newsletters to, to the traders. Um, we're finding maybe there wasn't a lot of cut through um, with the newsletters. So I actually supported this with um, videos that went to the traders, which I think really helped get across some of the information that they were, they were looking for in times of uncertainty. Um, we've sent out 10 newsletters to customers to let them know what's happening at the market. We've completely changed our um, marketing uh, approach for the first time, saying how, um, how, how open and clear the aisles were, how uh, safe and secure the market um, was. Um, so we got some fantastic reach and great support on our socials throughout that time. So our aisles have been cleared of market carts, our seating were removed, um, we stopped doing sell-off. So all the things that we love at the market, we've, we've had to put a pause on. Um, we participated in the U Park Plus offer for the car park from the 1st of April, um, which has caused some congestion in the car park in the last few weeks and will be expiring on the 30th of June. However, it was a great initiative um, to help bring people into the car park, um, particularly in April and May. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the other things that we have been um, conscious of during this period, both with traders and uh, the management team of uh, um, uh, mental health and wellness. Um, so we have made sure that we've provided um, opportunities for people to make sure that um, they're doing okay. We've also been liaising um, with other Melbourne-based markets, um, keeping abreast of, of what was happening and, and what they were doing over there. And of course, um, regular meetings with um, SAPOL to make sure that we were compliant with um, all the restrictions that were being in place. Uh, we also implemented a pre-order and drive-through service, uh, which helped customers come and still shop at the market if they weren't feeling that they wanted to come onto the market floor, um, which uh, we received some really great um, PR for, and it also achieved over 1,200 orders that went through that service during that time. We also had to make sure that we're compliant with the um, COVID emergency response commercial regulations as a landlord. Um, so we've had to get across that and make sure that we're compliant. And of course, all the basic safety and cleaning initiatives that, that, that you see, um, but increased cleaning frequency, increased security and floor wardens, um, hand hygiene stations, which you can see in the picture there, uh, floor decals, common signage, stall signage, um, and we've got automated half hour regular P, uh, PA announcements um, that remind everyone of social distancing. So it has been um, a really challenging period for the market, but I think it really has been in a time that we can see that um, ACMA and the traders and the council have worked uh, really well together to get the best outcome, um, to make sure that the market's been able to, to trade um, and really been um, a beacon for, for fresh food um, in the city. And now we head into a response time. I forgot the wrong slides. <laughs> um, and, and now we're starting to come out the back of it. We're starting to, to relaunch carefully and cautiously bring people back into the spaces, continuing to work with SAPOL um, with the next steps of the easing of the restrictions and uh, introducing and thinking about um, market activities and events in the back part of the year. And now moving on to talk about Christmas. So that's uh, a little bit of a summary of our recovery plan. Does anyone have any questions on the COVID response for the market? 
Yeah, Jody, I just um, the issue with the car parking and the congestion that's been caused. What's your thoughts on on that? How to address that, or what's the plan? What's the plan? So, um, as you know, the the um, eight dollar caps parking fee was introduced on the first of April. Uh, it worked fantastically for April and all the way through almost to the end of May. Uh, at that time, with the uh, increased number of people coming back into work in the CBD and then the other U -park, uh, car parks becoming full, it did start causing congestion in our car park towards the end of May. Um, we have responded and as of yesterday, um, the Adelaide Central Market U Park was withdrawn from the offer on a Thursday and Friday. Um, that really assisted, that worked immediately yesterday, Mark. So I was checking the car park numbers. I've become an <laughs> expert on the car park numbers. Um, and absolutely, we had adequate car parking at lunchtime yesterday, which is our peak trade time. So that has absolutely um, resolved the issues on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, and then the offer will change from the 1st of July at the Adelaide Central Market. So we've got two more days of, of the you know, a bit of a challenging time for the customers, which is the next two Tuesdays in June. However, we have got some good messaging out there and people realise that we've acted and changed the Thursday, Friday, and we'll adjust the rates from the 1st of July to make sure that we've got the adequate short-term parking for the market customers. Okay, that's good, thanks. Yeah. That's it. Thanks for that, Jody. Um, I think people have had an opportunity to ask questions during the session, so we might move on. But thank you for your uh, presentation today. It's good to hear from you. And um, feel free to leave if you'd like to. That's fine. Uh, and we'll we'll move on to our next presentation. So uh, we've got the Rundle Mall Authority. Joanna Williams is here. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Wait for this to. Oh. Hopefully, this one works. <laughs> I feel like tech issues at eight thirty on a Friday morning. Sorry, it just errored, so I'll just load it again. No worries, that's fine. I'll run through some similar info um, that Jody shared. Just a bit of a snapshot of who we are and what we do. Much like Jody. Uh, and Central Markets, Rundle Mall is also set up as a subsidiary uh, of council. Um, and we too um, here we go, have a, um, a, a governed by charter um, and a board of directors. Um, Peter Joy is the chair of our board and we have six, um, six other directors. Board. Oh, let's see. Sorry, let's see if I can, here we go. Um, we have also got a four year strategic plan and operate each year with an annual business plan that's um, directed and um, approved by our board. Um, our team, we've got 10 people in our team. So me as the general manager and then a team that's made up largely of marketing events um, and retail operations. We work really closely with the city of Adelaide um, to deliver all the operations uh, on the mall and support the, the work of the city of Adelaide uh, for all of the businesses in the precinct. The boundary of Rundle Mall uh, is actually quite big um, and goes from North Terrace to Grenfell Street and then King William to Pulteney Street and everything in between. Um, so we have 15 arcades and centres that run off the mall and about a thousand businesses, so 700 retailers and about 300 service providers that are within, within our precinct. Um, it's one of the busiest places in the state and um, certainly the economic heart uh, of the city with 24 million visitors and about a billion dollars in retail sales that go through our precinct. Um, in terms of the way our board and, and the way that we run the business, um, we certainly have a risk register that's reviewed by the board each month. Um, our top three risks uh, obviously have pivoted to COVID um, and the response to COVID and all the mitigation approaches to that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the response that we've done today and some of our roadmap going forward for COVID. Um, the economic and retail industry impacts are certainly a big risk for us and the, the number of retailers that we have in this space and how we're working with other industry bodies, with Business SA, with Shopping Centre Council of Australia uh, to mitigate some of the impacts that are being felt across the retail community. 
And then broadly, just emergency and crisis management, working really closely with SAPO um, and our security team to just make sure that safety uh, is absolutely paramount in the mall. We're funded um, a little bit differently. We're funded by a separate um, levy and a separate rate, um, as well as some supplementary income um, that we generate out of on mall activations and events. So we have two parts to our, our income. Um, all of our financials and reports are managed and presented each month to the board and approved by our board. And then like ACMA, we have an annual report and audited financial statements that are presented at our annual general meeting by the end of October um, in line with the charter. Um, in terms of what we do and how we do it, um, we are really here to, I guess, market and promote the mall uh, and make sure that it remains the state's premier retail and commercial shopping precinct. So really about making sure it's a vibrant, beating heart of the city uh, and ensuring that we promote it, that it's used by residents, visitors, the community, our traders, and that it's a safe and great place to shop. And we've broken our strategic focus down really about attracting attract, stay and enjoy. So it's really about getting people here to the heart of the city, um, making sure they stay a bit longer and ensuring that they have a great time while, they, while they're here. Uh, and our focus is really on four kind of key areas of information, experience, uh, advocacy and brand. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of the highlights um, over the last, um, well, 12 months, but pre-COVID certainly, and then I'll touch a bit on some of the COVID things. So. Um, for us in that kind of information and advocacy space, it's about being the hub of precinct information um, and influencing um, the precinct for growth and, and minimising any negative impacts. Um, so we gather up a lot of information, we do a lot of market research, we have a lot of insight into who our customers are, our traffic data, the performance data of the businesses. So making sure that we can share that through retailer forums, we send out a lot of um, newsletters and information to our businesses each fortnight. Uh, we do a lot of printed documents and we still distribute hard copies of information out to all of the businesses, hosting and holding regular meetings with all of the key traders in our precinct. We obviously also, as part of this, um, part of our business, worked with the City of Adelaide to complete and launch the Gawla Place redevelopment project before Christmas, um, including the great public art um, and green arbour installation. Uh, and then we've also um, I guess that, that that precinct, making sure that it's really activated and a vibrant part of that busy thoroughfare from King William, uh, sorry, from North Terrace through to Grenfell Street. Uh, we've also worked part of the advocacy part of what we do is working quite closely with state government and advocating for um, trading hours and working, I guess, on those additional trading hours available to all of the businesses. And when we worked quite closely on ensuring we got some extra hours for uh, Black Friday, for Boxing Day, during the fringe um, period and festival period over the Superloop weekend, and then certainly throughout this COVID period, ensuring that there's additional hours, uh, particularly for the supermarkets to trade, uh, and having those extra hours for customers um, available over this time. And then we've also worked uh, with a lot of our property owners and private developers around um, opening several flagship stores. So the Mecca flagship Sephora, which is a great introduction into the market, beautiful new forever new store, the Doc Martens store, Vietnamese laundry, amongst others. So just around ensuring that we're getting really new, interesting um, tenancies in the mall. In terms of the Rundle Mall brand, so a big part of what we do is in the marketing um, space. And last year we launched the new creative and the new brand with our new agency for the mall. And it was really about connecting uh, into an, the emotional connection that South Australians have uh, with the mall. And I guess really celebrating our iconic malls balls. Um, so everything that we do is really centered around coming back to that icon, being the heart of the city um, and that sense of, I guess, nostalgia and storytelling and the narrative that we have uh, with, our, with our customers and with our audience. Uh, we do a lot of work on our social media channels. We've had a big advertising campaign um, over that period in outdoor, in TV, in radio, print and digital, um, and certainly working really closely to drive strong PR um, stories and engagement as well. Um, in terms of the visitor experience, so this is really about ensuring there's a really easy and enjoyable visitor experience for everyone who comes to the mall. Uh, so again, working with, with Council and City of Adelaide really closely to deliver um, a really clean and vibrant mall and making sure all of our um, asset management, the cleansing is absolutely spot on. Uh, we partner really closely and work with SAPOL and security, like I said, to ensure 
overall safety and certainly through this COVID period, that's been really important. Um, big part of what we do is events and activations and some of them are big scale major events right through to some small um, small scale events and so we last year we did about 450 um, events and activations on the mall um, and in that period like for like just before COVID we were um, had seen an increase of about 14% in our events and activations that we delivered so from things like major major events like Vogue Festival uh, which brought in about 215,000 people over that weekend our Christmas campaign it was the biggest Black Friday campaign um, and trading day that we ever had in the mall on on Black Friday um, the Adelaide Festival Dolls House that we brought in through the festival period and we saw an increase of about 25 percent of traffic over that weekend launch for Adelaide Festival so really great you know big scale public art installations, um, big draw card traffic events, uh, and doing things that are new and different and interesting right through then to sort of some small, you know, charity activations and small brands that pop up on the mall as well. Um, in terms of our uh, COVID response, um, much like the markets, it's certainly been a challenging time in the, in the mall as well. Um, you know, that weekend of the, of the 13th of March, we sort of started to see the decline um, in traffic. Uh, and then through April, it was certainly uh, very quiet as most stores closed, but we certainly had uh, many of our essential services still running. So supermarkets, pharmacies, department stores, a lot of the um, food operators were still open for takeaway, uh, but it's certainly been very challenging um, for, for businesses in, in the mall. Uh, but we are seeing that come back up um, and we'll just go back to the previous slide. Um, we are seeing that all come back up, um, up and running. Uh, but we've had, like I said, extra cleaning and security, extra um, hand sanitizer stations that have been included in the mall, additional signage, um, supporting our businesses, um, making sure that all of that um, social distancing signage is in place. We've also supported the Council U Park um, program with Gawler Place and Rundle Street sent out lots of information to our businesses, really regular comms um, to all of the traders and to customers who visit the mall. We launched a new website at the end of April, which was also really meant that we could have an online campaign and an online opportunity to connect in with businesses and customers. Um, and also delivered, um, again, public uh, PA announcements through the mall, again, about safety and making sure that uh, people are reminded of social distancing. Uh, last week, in terms of our recovery and, and the next stages for us, we produced and released out to the market our Roadmap to Recovery booklet. So that was sent out to all the businesses in the mall and being shared um, through the community and our stakeholders and with, um, with the media. Um, and really about kind of focusing on the things that we're now going to put on the ground um, coming up. So we've got some pop-up seating areas, overhead lighting, fairy lights in trees, um, really about making them all feel warm and colourful, um, really kind of focused on a placemaking and activation approach in a staged, safe, incremental um, stepped campaign now through until Christmas. Um, adding in green walls and planter boxes, colourful flowers, a lot of pop-up food and beverage, a lot of public art. So, you know, we've seen the success of those wonderful, you know, silo arts, uh, you know, with South Australian artists. So bringing in some of that big scale um, art into them all. Um, and then as we head into Christmas, delivering, you know, from the 1st of November, a really strong um, support for our Christmas campaign. And all of that is then overlaid with a, um, a brand campaign that we're running through TV and digital advertising to really ensure that we're putting the message out there about Rundle Mall being safe um, and a place that is welcoming for people to come back. And that's, that's me. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Does it look like it? Thanks, Joe. Appreciate your Hello. presentation this morning, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, David, uh, Fanny, you look like yes. Sorry. Yeah, I was just asking. Um, in the way that um, Jodie's shared her risk register with us, are you able to share the risk register with a water and risk? I can. That's fine. Ours is just set out a little bit differently to Jodie's. Jodie's got a nice one pager. Ours is across about four pages, so I hadn't uh, hadn't included it in the presentation, but I can absolutely share that with with the team. I'll get that through. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks, Sony. Thanks, Joe. No worries. 
Uh, we will carry on. We've got another presentation uh, over to uh, Sonjoy uh, joining us. So we'll hand it over to you. And we've got a presentation with our papers. So assume we have read it, but if you can step it through as well, thanks. Great, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, so just to uh, review, um, we've over the last little while spent a lot of time um, looking through all of our IT systems uh, and looking at what some of the, the challenges that we had. So this is just a bit of a, a review and a bit of a background of what we're uh, coming from and what our plans are uh, going forward. Um, oops. Sorry, it's so uh, some of the challenges with our IT uh, landscape that we've got uh, now is that it's very much um, siloed. Um, so we've got individual systems uh, delivering uh, specific solutions for individual businesses. Um, and that's really come through uh, with the way that we were approaching uh, IT systems in the past. The challenges that uh, it results is that we've got an, a number of systems uh, in our uh, IT environment, and a lot of those systems do similar things, uh, but just slightly different. And there's also a lot, a lot of lack of um, integration with those systems. So we get a lot of duplications or systems don't flow from one to the other, uh, requiring a lot of manual uh, interactions or manual updating of multiple systems, hence the ability to access uh, information uh, in those systems to provide reports or, or to provide a level of uh, analytics is difficult. And there's also, uh, you know, a lack of having the really uh, 360 view of our customers as well. You can't really see the end-to-end the -end customer journey that we have uh, with our customers. Um, um, so the, the approach that we are taking now moving forward is uh, an enterprise architecture approach. Um, and that's really uh, a global standard in the way that um, modern IT systems uh, should be looking at, uh, should be implementing. Uh, and a lot of uh, organizations are doing that. Um, and slowly a lot of local governments are actually now adopting this process as well. What the enterprise architecture approach allows us to do it is it actually looks lets us look at um, not only the IT technology bit, but also looking at the business. What are the business functions? What are the standards around data that we have to look at uh, and adhere to? And then what are the, some of the common systems that we've got? Uh, so you can think of the enterprise architecture sort of like a, what a standard blueprint would look like for a house. You know, you kind of lay out the house, would look at where you, uh, where you want your uh, bedrooms and stuff like that. And then you build uh, to that architecture design. So uh, as you, so what we've done is taken that approach, review all of our systems um, and applications and how, what our customers uh, do um, and apply that through the architecture lens. What that provides us is uh, uh, ability to identify what our core systems are and what are our core platforms and how we perform those functions uh, in the organization and also tying that into our strategic plans and how we can ensure that our core systems um, uh, improve or the way we deliver or enhance the way we deliver our strategic plans. It also defines which platforms uh, perform what role. So we, we end up looking at reducing the number of systems that we've got uh, and remove that duplication, making it a bit more efficient on the way we deliver our, our systems and also looking at implementing modern solutions so that we can enable faster response to the business uh, uh, become a bit more agile uh, and also ensure that we've got uh, the data integrated with each other. So there's no um, duplication of efforts or processes. In essence, what, what our, uh, the architecture vision that we've got is basically a modular architecture which ded with dedicated building blocks. Um, so the way I kind of like to think about it is think of it as Lego pieces. So, so you're not having lots of Lego pieces doing individual things, but you take these Lego pieces, you can put them together into delivering uh, a business function or an outcome to our customers. Uh, and we don't need to have uh, duplicate systems running all over the place. Um, oops. So what the uh, so what we've done uh, is taking the EA approach that we've uh, uh, 
are adopting, uh, we've actually developed what our future target state should look like uh, from an application's perspective. So, you know, what, what are the things that we want to achieve and how do we want to achieve that? And then what are the things that we need to do to put in place to deliver that uh, based on the, the architectural principles? The principles that we really are, are, are moving towards is you know, ensuring that all of our IT investments that we do have a strategic alignment uh, so that we, we ensure that it's delivering on our on our goals, has to have a customer centric focus um, and it needs to be long term focus. So we don't want to spend uh, or invest in solutions that are only short, short lived, uh, but they really need to uh, provide long term benefits to the organization. We also need to build business capability. So as soon as so as we uh, implement new systems, we need to look at how can these systems tick more than one box. You know, how can we have a solution that can deliver uh, multiple capabilities uh, to the organization? And then we also want to leverage our system. So we don't we want to uh, making sure that we maximize the use uh, of all of our systems. So you know, we really want to make sure that we. Um, look at getting solutions that can be uh, configured uh, and uh, and reused by multiple organized uh, by multiple people in the business uh, and then obviously we want to be agile very quick uh, deliver solutions quickly to accommodate future changes be uh, being able to share uh, that information uh, to as many people as we can so that we can uh, ensure that we have uh, or allow or, the, or allow the ability to make um, uh, decisions with good good uh, data. So I'll just get to the next slide. So based on um, uh, the principles that we've taken, we've basically developed this um, architectural blueprint for us. So this is what our future target state is going to look like. And as you can see on the bottom row where it says the enabling systems, they're really the, the core, uh, or I guess the, uh, the core things that we need to uh, have in place to enable the, uh, the business to deliver on, uh, on their objectives. So things are on knowledge management. We've got the tools uh, to help support uh, the organization security is a fundamental thing so to ensure that uh, we've got secure systems that uh, that ensures our customers and our, and our users uh, privacy is put in place and then communications is more around making sure that we are, are leveraging the best uh, communication networks that we've got so the and being adaptable and flexible so things like as COVID has introduced working from home being able to be mobile uh, where we work uh, embracing mobility all of these core enabling systems uh, then uh, can be built upon to deliver some of the, the core back office uh, solutions. So if you look at the blue row, what we've done is now uh, uh, consolidate into uh, solutions that uh, are enterprise solutions. So have one event management system, uh, have one CRM system, have a single finance system. Uh, and then uh, the integration is really the key investment that we're spending uh, a lot of time around to ensure that we can now integrate the uh, the back office systems to our front office systems without needing to have bespoke solutions that deliver those things. Uh, and that information and integration layer here will also now allow, allow us to uh, provide analytics capabilities to the organization as well. And we're doing a lot of things around uh, supporting um, RMMA, for, for example, around people movement and analytics and, and stuff like that. And that's actually delivered through this new uh, integration uh, platform that we've got. And we're also looking at uh, improving the way that we deliver our frontline services. So looking at our new, uh, looking at new modern content management systems to be able to do online forms. Once again, I think the, the COVID-19 has, has shown that uh, people are, have or want the, to be able to interact online now more and more. So we need to look at how we can enable that quickly. Uh, and then there's other things around uh, from a smart cities perspective, the ability to take in information from uh, smart devices, IOT solutions, sensors, people movement sensors, uh, and then feeding that through into our decision support systems. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, uh, there's three aspects that uh, we need to uh, need to have to make sure that we can deliver on this target state. So we've developed Developed a, a business systems roadmap, so that's a plan for the next uh, three to three to five years around how we deliver on this target state, um, which has three transformational elements in there, which is around customer uh, knowledge and analytics, 
and then uh, uh, then another uh, section there around how we provide uh, business operational enhancements uh, as well. So there the uh, how we improve individual areas uh, with new systems and technologies. Uh, along with that, to, to be able to really uh, implement uh, the business system roadmap, it's really important for us to ensure that we've got it into our long-term financial plans. It's not something that we can just do in, in one year. It does it will take us a, lot, a few years to deliver that. So it's important that we've got that identified in, in, in our long-term financial plan, which we've got now. Uh, and then also the uh, IM resource. So, uh, the, making sure that we've got the right skills and capabilities within information management and the organization um, to actually then uh, implement the solution and then take advantage of what these uh, new solutions can do. So around uplifting uh, our internal capabilities, around um, analyzing data, uh, analyzing um, uh, how we do our processes and do process improvements and making sure sure that we've got the right resources in place to do that while also minimizing our costs as well. So not necessarily uh, relying on external suppliers and vendors, but also building that internal capability uh, for us as well. So that, I think that's, that's it. Is there any questions? Thanks, Sanjoy. Questions? I have some. If that's possible, uh, how Absolutely. far down the track are we? What's the progress on this? Yeah, so we're uh, 2021 is year two out of our five year plan. Um, so we have over the last over the last couple of years have made some progress. So we've implemented our new uh, data management platform. So that that's our integration layer. So that's in place right now. Uh, and we're using that to uh, enable our integrations into our new asset management system that we've got. Uh, so another project that we've got is a new asset management system. Uh, we're also now working with state government on the new uh, e-planning portal. So bringing that back in house. So we are uh, have, uh, in uh, in train right now, uh, and next year will be uh, year two of the of the bigger plan. And you're not looking at a integrated system, underlying integrated systems like a Tech One or those kind of an ERP or something like that. Yeah. It yeah, it, it's, uh, we have done a, a bit of a review uh, on uh, the benefits of an ERP or not. And I think uh, although the integrated system from an ERP is, is good, it, it does actually then tie us to one single supplier and provider. And I think it removes a little bit of that flexibility and agility because now we're dependent on a single uh, provider to for all of our systems. I think there's probably some, uh, there's definitely an opportunity to um, consolidate our systems um, because we probably have a number of systems that do the same thing. Not quite sure if, if uh, moving wholeheartedly into an ERP will actually provide us the flexibility that we need. I think our focus should really be around that in uh, ensuring that we can do integration really well. And what about the cost? What's the budget for this? What, how much are you gonna spend? Yeah, so uh, our plan for the next three years is uh, we're looking for about $3 million uh, uh, per year for the next three years to deliver on, on, uh, on the roadmap. And, and what about and that benefits? takes into account? Uh, yeah, so what we've done is provided, uh, so as we uh, go through each of our projects, we develop our project plans, and then we also do benefits realization as part of uh, developing the, the plans and then ensuring that uh, we then review and making sure that we deliver on those benefits. So we've uh, really tightened that up last year with our asset management uh, project. So we've got a, a detailed um, benefits realization um, matrix uh, and now it's looking at as we're now about to implement uh, the asset management system is now revisiting that to making sure that we're realizing those benefits so that's uh, that's inherently built into our project management process so is that um so is that in addition to the three million dollar budget like do you do you then have say expecting you know realized benefits uh that come out of the fact you spent the three million dollars each year i mean like we, something similar we did on Cabringo. there's eight million dollar benefit through license savings and things like that because you're consolidating systems and then reducing inefficiencies and you know headcount savings so what, what sort of benefits are we talking about realizing yeah it's uh i i'll have to take that on notice because uh because i don't have it in front of me overall from a project perspective um 
we are tackling the benefits, uh, the tangible benefits uh, on an individual project by project basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we have identified some high level benefits by uh, consolidating, or sorry, the way that we're approaching uh, our resourcing and how we apply. So currently, when we're delivering our projects, we're using a lot of external resources. So we're changing that model to internal resource mix. So that uh, automatically gives us a 20% savings in how we deliver our projects, but actual uh, individual project benefits. I'll have to get back to you on that one um, just to see where it's at. I think that would be a good thing to do. Something that we're doing at Onkopringa and it works yep. really well. It's about a uh, yep. No, absolutely hear you. Uh, and then also yep. are you going on site, is most of this going to be hosted uh, on site or are you talking about external hosting? Uh, so it's majority of our approach is uh, cloud first uh, and then um, so out, externally hosted through software as a service is our preferred approach. Uh, and then if that's not possible, uh, then we actually have our own public cloud environment. Which is on Azure, uh, so that's where we would uh, is our second uh, approach to that. So, not have anything on premise is what our preference is. Okay, sorry, a bunch of questions. I had uh, Sandy. You want to have a question? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually it's a follow up from what you said, David. Um, uh, the three million dollar investment was based on business case, so. <clears throat> Um, it would be very good if that if that benefits realization could be brought in because it's more mm -hmm. than just moving resources from internal to external or vice versa. Right. Yep. Um, there, you know, uh, we need to be really clear that for an investment of that size, um, and that was my understanding when it came through in budget, um, that there was some uh, significant benefits realization for that investment. So, uh, I'd like some real clarity on that to come yep. back through. Audit. Absolutely. Um, you may want to contact the people on Capringa. Uh, they, they're producing reports to that effect. It might be of interest and save you some time starting your own thing. Um, I, yeah, I no, think absolutely happy we, I think that was done ahead of time, David. My understanding and my, my, my memory certainly was that when that was brought in, it was uh, a business case and that was the part of the budget decision. But um, so I would like to revisit that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Nothing. Thanks, Sanjoy. Appreciate your presentation. It's um, no doubt we all found out how reliant we are on technology for the last three months. So, uh, but also we want to do do things smarter and um, cost effectively, and also give us real benefits. So, um, looking forward to seeing some outcomes from that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for that. We'll move on. Uh, we, we've got another workshop. We've got a workshop item now. Um, the business plan and budget. Uh, um, we've got the papers for that one. Uh, now, I don't know, Claire, are you driving or someone else driving this or Alex, maybe? Or... Um, so Anita is going to drive. We're not going to talk too much. I'm here okay. with Alex and Nicole. Um, if you're okay, we'll take it as red, Chair. Is that sure. all right? Yeah, so um, Anita, if you just go straight to slide three, um, please. So we're doing a two-step approach um, this year because obviously as a result of COVID, we spent um, the last few weeks with the help of audit and our council members um, working through the financial implications of the impact COVID has had on the city of Adelaide. Um, what we're proposing uh, to present to um, council next week to consider is a um, fees and charges and expenditure framework. So what that will allow us to do is um, continue to um, operate our core services as well as um, have fees and charges in place from the 1st of July. Um, and then on the 30th of June, we'll present to council a draft business plan and budget um, for public consultation. Um, Anita, if you just jump straight through to the key budget movements, I'll hand over to Alex just to talk through um, what the numbers are looking like. Um, Slide 11. 11, yeah. No, I'll yeah, so here are the key movements. I'll hand over to Alex just to talk through this for you. Uh, thank you, Claire, and through the chair. Good morning, everyone. 
Mm. So just to I suppose get to the crux of the key movements we have, uh, there's a very significant reduction in the operational income uh, as we foreshadowed in the earlier discussions. Uh, we're looking at about a $22 million reduction compared to the original draft budget prior to COVID and approximately $27 million uh, from the original, uh, from uh, the quarter to forecast, which is what we're using as a, the effective baseline. And that's predominantly around the, the U parks and the on street parking, but also contributed by um, the impact to, to the aquatic centre and particularly the events with uh, the town hall and in the parklands. Uh, and the important thing to recognise with that is that there's a fair degree of fixed costs uh, with those operations. So, and across the border fees for council. Uh, so there's limited scope to adjust those operational costs. We have done so where we can, uh, but the vast majority of those costs are relatively fixed. Then uh, we have what we've incorporated, a $20 million reduction in operational expenditure. Uh, this has been worked through as request from the elected members that we incorporated. And as you know, we're working through uh, the consideration of our services uh, at present, and that has been put in there while we do that. There's also what we're calling a one-off potential structural realignment costs of $14 million. Uh, that will be incurred in 2021, potentially. Uh, and that's to recognise the fact that the vast majority of our services are directly tied to uh, our staff and FTEs, and that if we reduce those services, then there will be potentially a flow on impact from that. The other thing to just highlight is that there's been a very significant reduction uh, with infrastructure plan. A real reset as such to ensure we focus on the delivery uh, of the core renewal that need to be done for 2021 and also to make sure that the full 1920 program is delivered. So once you actually put those together along with the major projects, the actual component to deliver next year is not dissimilar to what has been delivered in prior financial years. And we're hoping that that provides an opportunity to make sure we can uh, deliver the full program, uh, reduce those carry forwards that we've had in the past, and uh, in doing so, though, there is some impact on the maintenance activities. Uh, so we have factored that in as well. Uh, so I think we'll leave it there and then uh, just hand over to any questions anyone would like to ask. Thank, thank you. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, Okay, over to any members for questions or comments about this paper. I'm okay so far, Chair, so we can move yep. on. If you like. So nothing from you? No. Um, David, I had a, David. Yep, sorry. <clears throat> We've been through it in quite a bit of detail with Council, so mm -hmm. I'm really keen to hear from um, the independent members of audit. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, uh, on page eight of your presentation, which I think is 18 of the papers, um, just the talking about the um, quarter four rates, just, you know, just some sense of how we're doing in terms of collections. You've got, um, say, 72% of the, the total collected um, as of the 10th of June, how would that compare to a normal quarter? Like, you know, when we used to pre-COVID quarter, would that be similar or, or or is it showing a slowing of payments? What's the thinking? Um, the, the data was showing it was just slightly behind, but we do have Liz here. Liz, are you able to just provide a more accurate update? <laughs> Yep. Probably doesn't have to be accurate, but just a you know just a sense of you know yep. has it been as bad as we thought it could be, or is it 
closer to almost normal. No, so through the chair, David, it's actually while we are behind for um, approximately the same time last year, it is tracking a lot better than we probably would have um, anticipated at the right. outset. Um, so we're tracking that on a weekly basis as to how we're going compared to the same time last year. Okay. And the hardship applications, 160 doesn't seem horrific in terms of... No, so the hardship applications have been, again, quite, um, I guess, compared to what they could have been, quite low. Um, we've touched base now with every single applicant and uh, most people are either doing a deferral um, approach or they're doing a payment plan. Um, and we've had a few that have just been delayed by a couple of weeks. So we've taken all those on board, but um, as I said, compared to what it could have been, it's a lot better. So in a sense, just, sorry, Ross. Uh, just uh, thought I'd make a comment there. I, I'm a rate payer and I just thought I'd ring up and go through the motions of saying, you know, I've got my uh, rates here. Uh, is there any uh, delays I can do? And then they said, they said, well, you know, you can go through the hardship provisions and I said, oh, and I'll just pay the account. So I think they did it very well. They, they the people on the phone, um, as we wanted them to, you know, so we're discouraging the delay. You know, you take a delay, you get it, but if you go through a hardship thing, you won't do it. So basically I think that that worked well and I hopefully my my experience there is um, common because I think we've done very well on the telephone. Yeah, probably oh. in a sense, it probably vindicates the decision not to not to just waive rates for everybody because yes. it indicates yes. that you know it hasn't been as bad as perhaps was first thought at the beginning, and um, uh, you know would have been a lot more pain if we just waived all those rates. Yes, could I ask Mark what his comments are on that? Think Mark's. Sorry. Sorry, Ross, I just missed the question. So the question was, uh, it, we, we had a policy of how we handle the um, remittance of rates and whatever else, and that was really, you know, just only on a hardship basis. Has that, has that worked out okay, or are there any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very active um, matter at the moment, and... Um, it seems to me that the hardship provisions are being used effectively and are being um, applied with some level of common sense. So um, we had a number of inquiries early on and I, I guess a reluctance to use the hardship provision. Um, but what I've been advised through both Claire and Liz that um, we are working through kind of productively any applicants that we receive and um, so far it's been quite effective. Um, but Claire or Liz may be able to provide more clarity on that. Um, and if I could just, just add to that, Chair, um, I think um, what we're also hearing is that there could be impacts felt a bit further um, through the calendar year. And so while this quarter might look okay from a rates income perspective, um, there's still a sense that perhaps quarter one, next financial year, quarter two, could still um, see a bit of a, an impact for ratepayers. Um, and they uh, deferral to the 31st of August. Um, we'll probably have a bit more sense as well in the coming weeks um, whether 31st of August is going to be achievable for our ratepayers or whether we might need to extend uh, some of that out. Another quick question, still on the same page, is the, the draft bill, is that, what's the status on that? Is that uh, as far as I'm aware, it's um, hasn't been finalised, so it's still a draft, um, presumably still working its way either through the upper or lower hand. Thank you. Um, further to that, uh, Ross, if I could just clarify, um, I mean, the issue of financial assistance to small business is a very active matter that Council is interested in. Um, we have a resolution of council that we need to report by the first meeting in July demanding options um, for rate exemptions or um, any other options that are available. So whilst um, the rate hardship provisions are effective at the moment, um, the council members are very keen to look at 
what other what other levers there are and what other options. And you know, we've been um, we've been assessing how we're performing against other states and other capital cities. Um, and there are a variety of, of levers being used. Um, one of them is is a waiver of rates issue, and um, at this stage, councils in other capital cities have um, resisted waiving rates or percentages of rates, and are really focused on deferrals as as the mechanism to assist. Um, however, so the resolution of council, you know, um, really does seek to um, to be provided more detail on options. So. Uh, Claire and I will be working on, on that report going into, into the first meeting in July. So there'll be more discussion at the council member level um, on those options and, and we'll see how it goes. But obviously, whatever we do in that space will have budgetary impacts and we need to be very mindful of that given our budgetary position. Thank you. The uh, parking side of things, obviously, um, there's been uh, some commentary today around uh, parking you parks being quite full and I've experienced it myself. Um, obviously the some of the impacts being around um, perhaps the amount we're getting every day is obviously down because of the the cards. But um, where where we like thinking around the parking, it's not quite as bad as we were expecting. Um, so, off street, uh, the U Park path has proven to be really popular, um, but obviously it's at a price point that's less than what we had um, budgeted. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly um, making sure that there's full capacity within our U Parks. Um, and on street is pretty much as we expected. So, um, it's still much lower than what we uh, anticipated. And that flows through obviously to expiations as well. Um, I think once um, people start to return to the city for work, um, our expectation is that um, more people are likely to drive, more people are likely to use on street options. Um, and so um, even though the fees and charges for on street um, were uh, recommended to council, they remain as is for. Uh, the first six months of uh, the next financial year, uh, we're hoping that we'll see a bit more of a pick up on, on street. Right. Just uh, further to that, the, just further to that, the main uh, reduction obviously has been in uh, the rate, uh, maximum of $8 compared to up to maybe $18 for, or $19 for early bird. And obviously we've also got days in which um, we've got people who come in and miss early bird and get charged up to potentially $30 a day. So we're not picking up that income we'd otherwise get. Mm. We're saying it's about 50% of what it normally would be on average. Uh, but the real challenge is, is to look at how we sustain the occupancy levels while we uh, look at bringing the pricing back up to a more sustainable level. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, it's also uh, from a pricing level, we have to look at um, sort of the ecosystem in terms of how people are getting into the city. And um, while our pricing is sitting at $8, it is actually the same cost as catching public transport. So yeah. people are opting to drive in. Um, as soon as our pricing starts to go back up, even if that's to ten or twelve dollars, there'll be a shift back to public transport. But we're still only not not all businesses are back up at the moment, um, so we haven't got a you know hundred percent flows in terms of you know that normal three hundred plus thousand that would come in. Um, I believe the university campuses are coming back on in July after the semester break that'll make a big difference in terms of the flow um, so and at the moment there's a lot of discussions around that transition in terms of staggering of uh, workforces Mark and I have been a part of a transition group just looking at what we can do across the city for start times and 
um, uh, a for safety around public transport, but also so that we can get the flows back. And it might mean that um, the days are a little bit longer in terms of um, hours in the city, but um, hopefully that will work in our favour. Mark, did you want to add anything on that one? Because that's the, the most recent thing we're trying to work through. Yeah, I think um, from our own workforce perspective, um, I'll be meeting with Claire and Vanessa, I haven't mentioned it to Claire yet, but just to talk about our own workforce and how we do manage the gradual return to work and um, and how we do structure that so that we can yeah. well, exacerbate the problem of big periods of travel. So that's an active piece of work we're doing. Yeah. And also looking at alternate modes. So at what point do we bring you know, e-bikes back and scooters back and all of that sort of stuff. So at the moment, none of those are operating. So um, it's it's a matter of uh, how we, and the timing of which uh, we bring that back. And um, so uh, it's been a huge uptake in terms of, and really popular uh, with workers, but um, it, we can't continue that way for the rest of the year, so. Um, possibly in certain places, because it really goes back to capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe worth talking a little bit about, um, so the long-term financial plan indicators, Mark, uh, uh, page, I've got that as, is that page 13 of the report, or page 23 of our papers. Um, I think we've been talking a little bit about a, um, you know, a traffic light system when it comes to long-term financial plan, uh, and um, mm -hmm. I, I guess it tells a story um, when you see, you know, quite a bit of red and amber on there. Um, probably more than what you'd want to see normally. Um, so I think there's some. Um, it, it should actually, I think, assist when it comes to. Um, making decisions about where you know what we can afford to do or not afford to do, uh, something like this is is a reasonable, reasonably good lever to be able to indicate. Or well, if you spend more, it's only going to get worse. Or if you can save more, we can improve on on some of these areas or increase our revenues. Appreciate it's not always easy to just increase the revenues, particularly in the current environment. But um, it does indicate that we've got some period of time before we sort of get back into operating surplus. Um, it, it's got some issues around, clearly we're not gonna be able to spend as much on our on our assets in the short term because of um, challenges with, you know, uh, again, I guess cash flow around this COVID particularly. Um, it does kind of raise questions around how, what does our debt level look like and what can we afford and, um, what do we use debt for and all those kind of questions as well. Perhaps if um, anyone wants to make any kind of comments about the long-term financial plan, particularly around the key indicators and or um, talk us through that at all. Uh, thank you, Chair. If I could just uh, raise one aspect, which is obviously the, the borrowings and uh, exceeding of the potential limits. Uh, this is based on our existing treasury policy and the existing potential limits. And I think one aspect that was foreshadowed as part of the quarter three revised forecast would be, we'd be reviewing that. And uh, obviously in the papers today, we've uh, raised uh, the proposed adjustments to those ratios. Uh, so this is based on the existing ones. If you do apply the new ones, I believe that we would be, uh, for want of a better term, in the green uh, throughout the period, uh, <clears throat> that those revised uh, ratios would adjust our current potential limit from approximately $80 million up to $175 million. Uh, we had a discussion or got feedback on the 28th of May from uh, the special committee meeting around the comfort level of that. Uh, and the general consensus from our understanding was 
there was comfort provided there were some very clear guidelines in terms of what we use borrowings for and to make sure that that's applied for city shaping projects or projects that have got a clearly defined return on investment. So uh, yes, those uh, <coughs> the indicators are uh, concerning from that perspective, but underlying the fact that we do have a very solid and stable uh, asset base. The operating surplus ratio, uh, as we've discussed, we have included in the budget a reduction of $20 million. That for 2021 is offset largely by both potential one-off structural realignment costs of $14 million. Uh, but then going forward, you can see that there's a significant improvement in that. Unfortunately, at this stage, it isn't quite at the point that it is a surplus uh, for 2021 through to uh, 25, 26. Uh, but that's certainly a piece that's a very clear focus that we're continuing to work on uh, to bring that back up to a uh, operating surplus uh, as soon as possible. So you see that um, $20 million um, reduction next year as being a permanent reduction in your cost? Is it, you know, are you looking to have a strategy of ensuring that you don't get scope creep or, um, you know, contractor management and all the kinds of things you need to sort of keep those, keep those costs out of the business? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can, I'll, I'll respond to that if you like. Um, no. I guess um, just in broad terms, with regard to our financial sustainability, this um, COVID-19 has provided a, a kind of defining moment. Um, and, and one where we've um, reset, significantly reset the business. And there are a range of levers that we are pulling at the moment to, um, to put ourselves in a much better position going forward. Um, the $20 million saving was a resolution of council, and you can see that um, the impact of that $20 million saving is critical on, a, on our financial sustainability. And so it's something that was um, required and necessary. There are a range of levers within that $20 million that we'll be looking to pull to achieve, um, and those things are going to be worked through with council. So the $20 million challenge that was set by council uh, required us to report back to them uh, with regard how we're going to achieve that. Um, and that is going to be um, achieved fun fundamentally through a reduction in our workforce, um, the potential for, um, for outsourcing various components of our, of our operations, and, and finally to, to put in place a much more strategic framework of how we are structured going forward. So there are a number of aspects. Um, the key challenge in, in all of that is to ensure that the $20 million is recurring and, and is something that is going to stay in place and not creep back into place over time. And uh, by, by way of use of temps, use of contractors and that, that kind of thing. So as part of the, um, the $20 million challenge, we'll be putting in place um, some non-negotiables um, as far as the exec goes with, with regard to holding the line on the savings that we achieve. So it's a massive piece of work that we are deep in the middle of at the moment as an exec team. And uh, when we report to council fairly soon, we'll be outlining the method by which we'll be achieving those savings. And we'll be seeking political support to, um, to make that happen uh, because it's not gonna come without some pain. So um, it's a very live you know, matter at the moment. But I think um, you can see from the long-term financial plan, it's absolutely necessary that we achieve those savings. And I think it does show you that it will, will put us back on the right course um, as, it, as it really needs to. So, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I think absolutely. I think absolutely clearly demonstrates you need to at least do that. Um, uh, and, and there still may be other opportunities as we go as well. But um, okay, thank you. I, I know there was a question here around the, um, the prudential level for debt. Um, that was a sort of a, a Page yes, 28. direct question to us. Um, I can't find it now. 28. 28. 28. Thank you. Um, 
38. 38. Yeah, right. Sorry. I got the wrong 28. Go for 38 then. Yeah, I've got it now. Um, yeah, so the... So in terms of the... Um, the, you know, the debt levels, um, I mean, obviously, uh, we, we don't set the debt level. Um, that's not a role of the Earth Committee. We're happy to provide comment on it, but it's not like we won't set it. Um, it ultimately, it'll be something that sit, sits in the, um, the chamber to make a decision on. But from, from my point of view, um, from what I've read of it, it looks like you've got the capacity to deliver on it. I'm, I'm echoing terribly, sorry. Um, but uh, I would hope that you, you're not looking to push up to those sort of levels um, would be the thought, I think. Just gonna get my headphones and see if that helps. Um, any comments? Uh, I think the feedback's when other microphones are open, David, so as long as we mute ourselves while um, each person speaking, it's not so bad. Sure. Uh, Ross, do you want to comment on the? Yes, just basically, you know, it is the going to the one seventy five is obviously the the limit. Obviously, it's not where we want to be, and um, and obviously it doesn't give uh, license to just go go to one seventy five. I think we should obviously minimise the borrowings as to see we can. I think there's more work to be done on that. So. Um, I, I understand the need to go to 175 as a limit, but it's certainly not to be used. Um, uh, so I don't think, if I could just some... say, I don't think there's any intention for us to borrow straight to 175. It's actually setting a limit so that we can look at our long term financial plan yep. and Great. see what the impacts would be. Each of those decisions will come into council separately and will come through audit committee anyway yep. as we go. Um, and some of the reflections in the long-term financial plan uh, in terms of those borrowings, it certainly doesn't hit the 175 limit, but it's, no. it's really more of an exercise to work through with council uh, as to what the top end of an increase would be and actually what those ratios look like if we get there. Thank you. And further to that, if I could just add, they're, they're very valid comments. Um, the intent with any any future um, borrowings would be um, in response to stimulus opportunities and and also to target income generating opportunities as well. So, as the Lord Mayor said, we would be reporting on an individual basis, but it just provides a strategic um, limit to what we'd be prepared to move towards. It's been poorly reported as we will be borrowing that amount of money, which is not the case. Um, but um, there there are certainly some expectations from the state and the federal government that local government will be a player in the stimulus response required for the community coming out of COVID-19. We have our limitations, but we do have some capacity as long as it, it really stacks up for the ratepayer and there is matching or if not matching, greater than matching funds available to achieve some, some stimulus um, productivity. So it's a piece of work that's really important and it has been sensationalised in the media Unfortunately so, but um, you know, I think this is a fairly measured approach and we'll just set some parameters that the council can work towards, uh, reminding again that um, each, each matter would have to have some real clarity over the, the reasons why we'd be looking to borrow. Um, David, that, that uh, decision hasn't come through council yet. It's, been, it's come through as a workshop. Okay. Uh, so it's one of the assessments that we're making. It will come through with business plan and budget uh, when we make the decision in council in a few weeks. Yeah. I mean, certainly uh, one of the factors, obviously, in looking at levels of debt is also the serviceability and the, you know, the uh, interest associated with it. In a, in a low rate environment, which we've sustained for, well, it feels like a long time now, seven or eight years, and, and possibly will continue to, um, that is certainly a factor in in your capacity, and and obviously that's demonstrated in some of the other ratios. But um, yeah, it's yeah. also um, uh, I think with the um, the team have made it very clear what that foregone income has looked like and what the impact has been on our budget to deliver services as well. 
Um, so the fact that we've frozen the rate in the dollar for the last five years, and and it looks very likely that we will do again in this budget, um, that's actually had a, an impact of, um, I'm not sure, well, Alex, is it between 15 and 18 million, something like that? It would be. Mm. Just um, further, David, um, the, um, you know, the sustainability ratios, I think the sec local government sector will need to take a close look at those ratios and almost come up with a COVID-19 set of rate, um, sustainability ratios because the circumstances are quite different for the next number of years. And so that's a, that's a discussion that the CEOs are having uh, uh, at the metro level at least about how they're going to reshape the sustainability levels to respond to the circumstance that we have at the moment, as is what's happening across the state and federal government. Really. Sure. Chair, yeah, could I move to uh, page 41 or page 34 of the papers? It's the, um, the uniform presentation of finance, long-term financial plan that goes out obviously the 10 years. And um, the thing that strikes me is that normally in these long-term plans, you get years four, five, six and onwards, and a fairly general assessment. What normally happens is that there's not much capital expenditure in the budget because you don't know what you're doing in six years' time, but normally there's an operating surplus. So you, you normally get the last, say, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years would have healthy operating surpluses before you decide to make some decisions about spending that money. What's happened here is that net capital expenditure, you can see at the bottom there, is nil for the last five or six years. But obviously the operating surplus is not substantial. It's just to sort of almost break even. So that's the worry in that um, we've really had we're not having capital expenditure, which obviously we'll be having because we'll make some decisions on that, um, but we haven't really got the um, the operating surplus to be able to you know, use for that those sort of purposes for other sort of projects and, and uh, other uh, matters that the council wishes to do. So that, to me, is a bit of an issue because it just says um, we, haven't, we know we're going to have capital expenditure in there, we're not sure where the money's going to come from. Any comments on that? Yeah, Ross, I think um, you picked up on a, an important point. Um, I would be interested to know whether the Audit Committee has a view on, on the concept of zero rate in the dollar increases uh, and the sustainability of, of that approach. Um, we've never really heard from the Audit Committee on that particular matter. There's an assumption from council and an expectation that we will continue with zero rate in the dollar increases. Um, and uh, you can see that even with the savings that we're looking to generate, that there is still a modest um, opportunity to get back into surplus. And, uh, and so you've outlined that pretty well. Um, yeah, um, I, I, we're talking about, there are obviously a range of levers that we can look to pull, um, but other than further savings, um, you know, the position is what it is um, on the basis of not increasing our income. Um, mm. So, yeah, I'd be interested to know whether the committee has a view. Mark, my view would be that, um, and I'm also a ratepayer, but my view would be that I think this year, to me, it seems appropriate to have a nil increase, but I would certainly wouldn't uh, exclude, I wouldn't expect there to be continued nil increase in rates uh, in the dollar from, from now on after 2021. And I, I would agree with that. I think it's um, not sustainable unless you can find other sources of income. And we've demonstrated that um, some of those other sources of income are perhaps a little bit more tenuous when something like COVID hit. So, um, you know, if there's only a few levers, you get more income or you save more money um, or you borrow more. There's only that's the only way to deal with the fact that you haven't been generating enough in the rates to cover all the the projects. Um, the only other thing is, I think I'd be seriously looking at some of the projects that have happened over the years, um, and and bringing it back to you only do projects if they generate income um, and generate a return. Uh, and I think. I don't know that's a challenge because there's always going to be projects people want to do, but uh, it's going to have to come back to can we afford to do it? Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a general view that um, core services is the, fo is the focus and that is something we need to look at. 
And I believe the $20 million saving is a good target, but I believe that on the basis of either a zero rate in the dollar increases or decrease in, in the rate in the dollar will require further savings to be achieved. So that's sure. something we need to closely look at. Um, but we need to get our head around it fairly soon. So the, the long-term financial plan that I, that I see at the moment is a good step forward, uh, but I think there's more work to be done um, to ensure that we're in a good position going forward. So um, yeah, be interested in the other views of members. Paula, did you? Yeah, I think I, I, on that note, you know, you've asked for feedback about the committee. Um, I, I agree. I think it's all very well to say we'll have, you know, zero rate, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're getting to the point where you're borrowing anyway, all you're doing is effectively imposing a larger rate base in the future generations. And I think there's got to be some point where that just not, that just cannot be sustainable. So, you know, it, it's just... The, something has to give and, and it has to be done in a more equitable way. The um, only other thing I did see, the asset sales flagged in 23, 24, 24, 25, maybe $25 million proceeds. The, any reason on why that perhaps might take so long? I mean, three or four year process, is, it, is, that, is that how long it takes or...? We've recently undertaken a strategic property review mm. and, um, you know, we, we need to be mindful of the environment in which we choose to dispose of underperforming assets and reinvest in performing assets. It's not something that can be, uh, I guess, uh, progressed rapidly. Um, mm. It needs to be done carefully. So um, the council has, has a view of setting up a future fund, or that's what we're intending to recommend, is setting up a future fund so that any, um, any income generated from property sales can be reallocated towards income generating new property, uh, new activities. So that's what we're working on at the moment. We've never really focused in recent years on, on our strategic property portfolio or, or what we are going to do and how we're going to properly manage manage them. So it's been a, a good piece of work we've been doing over the last six to 12 months. Um, and you know, council is looking forward to progressing its, its decisions, I would imagine, on, on how we manage our portfolio in the next um, period. But it's just not going to happen in you know, a matter of months. It's going to be a matter of years to ensure that we do the right thing. So yeah, it's a, it's a kind of work in progress. The, the other thing, um, I in the statement of comprehensive income, so page 32 of the report or 42 of our papers, um, I did do know the employee costs don't necessarily seem to dip as much or managed as much as, as perhaps, you know, if, if a reasonable percentage of that 20 million comes from that area, I'm not sure it flows through in later years. Um, you know, 21, 22 drops about, seven million dollars but then it's sort of you know maybe more than just a a normal cpi increases or um enterprise agreement type increases year on year after that um is that kind of is that where it's still i suppose someone's done the analysis but is it really is it really giving us the kind of savings that perhaps we're thinking oh sorry mm -hmm. yeah go on so, uh, as we've discussed in 2021, uh, we've got a $20 million reduction offset by the $14 million. Uh, and then, yes, in 21, 22, in theory, you've got uh, $20 million reduction bedded in. Um, perhaps if I take that one on notice and just come back with a bit more mm. detail behind the assumptions on that. Yeah, just I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's not obvious in. in just the employee costs. That's all. It might might be somewhere else, um, Alex. Okay, I'm just conscious of time. Um, is there anything else you think you need an answer on or comments from from the audit committee? Um, otherwise, I think we do need to start to bring this to a, a close to be able to finish the rest of our business. Nothing else. Yes. Just one point of clarity: the treasury policy. Uh, will yes. have to be considered by council this coming Tuesday night, uh, <clears throat> in addition to the expenditure framework and the uh, 2021 fees and charges. 
Okay. Um, and were there any specific comments from any members on on the policy? Um, I was fine with it. You're okay with it, Paula? Ross, you're okay? Okay, excellent. I think what we'll do is um, we don't need a motion. We'll just bring this um, item to a close. Uh, and then we do still have um, a number of things I'm going to bring home in the next 20 minutes. So um, thank you for that. I will. Uh, um, hand over to the external audit management letter. Uh, Andrew's been sitting patiently joining us. So um, Andrew, do you want to unmute for a minute? And um, we've obviously all had a chance to read the report, but is there anything particularly you want to raise in addition to that or? Oh, I still can't hear you, Andrew. You appear unmuted, but we can't hear you, so. Can anyone hear, can anyone hear me? Yes, that's a good start. Um, <laughs> um, Andrew, do we, we've lost you. Hello. 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 Yep. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, th thanks for uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to to present and also to listen to the to the conversation. That was that was excellent. Um, in terms of the letter, I can take it as read. I think possibly one of the other points I want to just draw out. Obviously, COVID has been a, a, a significant talking point through this, um, and I guess from the time at which we presented our audit plan to now. Um, has um, has come to light uh, and is causing um, some issues. So in terms of the flow and impact for the year end financial report um, and the impacts for, for council, the, the one that I just wanted to sort of flag and, and draw people's attention to is it probably backs off the, the discussion around car parks, particularly U Park is the valuation of assets. Um, council will go through their normal process around revaluations, which we've flagged there of bridges, traffic signals, uh, lighting and electrical and civic um, in the normal course of business. Um, every year we consider impairment of assets to make sure that you know, if there's been any decrease in value uh, and there's you know, obviously there's some indicators there um, that may potentially, particularly on the commercial assets where the valuations tend to be more based on cash flow than um, depreciated replacement cost, um, some um, some attention to, to put into those. Um, that's probably, that's a unique issue um, for the city of Adelaide compared to a number of the other metropolitan councils who have a lower um, and smaller uh, commercial asset base. Um, so I just wanted to draw that out as probably one of the key the key aspects there um, mm. arising. Uh, no, nothing else particularly sort of new and emerging as a result of our work. Uh, we've been through a two week audit planning uh, won't call it a visit because we weren't on site. Um, we, we worked through that remotely and that's worked uh, pretty well. Uh, we've, we've got um, portals and, and ways to communicate with management that have, that have that's worked relatively effectively. Uh, but we would imagine um, as we come up to the sort of the year end audit visit in August, um, uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch with, with the team. It'll just be you know, working out whether uh, the team's on site or, or off, but either way, we're confident that we're going to be able to deliver what we need to, to deliver. We've got the technology and are able to work with um, with with council's finance team effectively uh, for that. In terms of the work that we've done, you look nothing at this point that would, would um, indicate any issues with the internal controls. Um, uh, the, the issues as we have had probably, you know, over the course of the years uh, around fixed assets, most of those um, come through at the, at the year end visit. So we'll keep people up to date uh, on that. Um, the issues around that we had at the, the conclusion of the audit last year around green assets and those types of things, we understand that there's less um, uh, less of that development going on this year um, for, for a number of reasons. So um, we don't expect that will be um, a, a, as much of an issue for this year, but we'll obviously work through that um, at year end. So um, that's, that's basically the run through of where we're at at this point. Thank you, Andrew. Um, if there is any impairment on car parks, is that uh, expected to have an effect on the profit and loss statement or is it gonna go through an asset revaluation reserve? 
Uh, it would go through the asset revaluation reserve um, I, uh, to the extent that there is asset revaluation sure. reserve on those. And I would imagine that there would be, I haven't looked at that in specific yeah. detail, but no. We'll yeah, it'd be that. helpful to get a, a, a fix on that yep. sometime soon. Chair, sure, I have a question for Andrew just on whether he's looked at the capital work in progress at this stage. We, uh, we haven't looked at that in, in detail in terms of the work that we do in detail at the end of the year. Um, the, the, the internal team still got to work through their process, um, but our update and understanding based on the controls work, the system updates that we've done, um, uh, the volume of and the type of transactions compared to the previous year um, uh, are different, not as significant. So we're not anticipating there to be um, the level of issue that we had last year. Thanks for that, Andrew. Um, I think in the interest of time, we might uh, keep moving. So I appreciate your involvement today and uh, acknowledge that it was helpful for you to be involved when we were talking through some of the other matters at any rate. Um, can I have someone move that we um, uh, that we note the report, please? Uh, lost it. Thanks, Paula. Seconded by Ross. <coughs> All in favour? That's carried. Sandy, you yep, voting. Thank you. Now, Sandy, um, did you just send me a note that you're needing to leave soon or? Yep. Uh, yes, I have uh, an appointment at Government House, but Councillor Canal is here and he's my proxy. So uh, when I leave shortly, um, he will step in. Thank you. Acknowledged. Thank you. Um, and David, um, David, I also have to let you know, I need to leave as well. So, but um, okay. I can take it from here. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll push on. Um, Item 6.2 is the internal audit plan. I know Jess has joined us. Um, again, we've got the paper. We should have had a chance to read it. Um, any particular comments for Jess on the plan? Acknowledging that we're looking to do some more of this in-house this year uh, as one of the cost-saving measures. Jim, my general question too um, is just basically, we've got 70,000 allocated, presumably that's to, for the externals. What particular project are we looking for externals to do? Uh, thank you and through the chair. Um, the three projects the externals will be doing will be, um, so KPMG will be doing both the project management review and software license review. You might remember they have been on, um, they were on our previous internal audit plan and we had to defer them. Um, and that was in our last internal audit progress report. So both of those, and then the PCI compliance um, audit, which is a, which we now have to do every year. So that's um, going to be done through CQR in November. So they're the three external audits as such we'll be doing, and the rest of them will be utilizing our in-house capability. Thank you. Um, Jess, the, I was um, brought back memories when you're doing an employee gifts and benefits internal audit. We haven't done one since 2012-13. Probably feels about that long. Um, and I think it's wise to do it again. Um, is there any uh, coverage in that one around procurement cards um, at all? Or do you, is, you know, do you think we any need for us to have a look at you know that area again i mean it was topical a few years ago around councils generally um but um is it i'm just wondering if any thoughts on that one uh thanks david yes um so procurement cards is in credit cards purchase cards for staff yeah. Yeah. Um, now we did do a credit card compliance um, order in 2018-19, which oh, okay. identified a number of findings. Um, however, the post order implementation review that we that's on this plan will then look at the previous few years completed audits and we'll go back and um, basically re-audit those findings to make sure all the actions that we said we're going to do are now in place. So I think it will be picked up through that um, particular project. Okay, sorry, I, I was reading the note in the employee gifts and benefits saying that we hadn't done purchase cards since 2012, 13, but it must have been just the gifts and benefits side of it. Yeah. That's okay. All right, I think that's fine. 
I don't have any other questions or comments about the plan. Appreciate that we're going to have to do some things a bit differently for a, a year or two uh, and um, be strategic on how we use our external resources on this. I'm happy maybe someone move it then if that's the case. Thanks Ross, seconded by Paula and uh, all in favour, it's carried, we've got everyone's hand. Thanks Alex. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks Jess, appreciate that. Um, we have an independent member discussion. I'm going to suggest that we have probably had opportunities to have inputs today. We'll make that more formal in future meetings when we've probably got a bit more time. I do want us to finish our agenda though, if we possibly can. Yeah, can I quickly add one to it that just yep. came up yesterday? Sure. Uh, Councillor Canile was also at a virtual meeting of KPMG where they talked about behavioural issues, not behavioural, behavioural economics issues are post COVID-19. And there are a couple of relevant ones for council. One in particular was that they said, there's likely to be a, a need or a, a, a hope by, meant by um, ratepayers and other members of the community about more human behavior, you know, seeing humans rather. So in other words, on the telephone, they, they the comfort in terms of speaking to humans rather than answering, um, you know, press the button type thing. And uh, I thought it was very interesting also the fact that um, they could see local governments as sort of a, a place of um, you know, reliability and comfort. And I just thought I'd just mention that because I think it's valid in that we should, as a council, be, you know, thinking more and more about our ratepayers in particular and helping them out in these uh, fairly uncertain times. So I thought it was quite um, quite interesting and maybe uh, Councillor Canola might add to that. Yes, uh, thank you for, thanks for that in, uh, and uh, good morning. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we, it is a significant change in how people are prepared to do things. And I think it's uh, uh, all these Zoom meetings and things like that, that uh, people do need to want to reach out. And I think that was the, the main issue is that enabling people to feel uh, that we are getting through this. And I don't want to say through this together because that was one of the hated words besides uh, unprecedented times. Um, you know, and uh, we do have a big role because we're the only level of government they actually touch. And I think uh, it is important that uh, we, we use that and use our place to be able to do that. So, and that, uh, you know, and it is trying to understand what, the, what the, the, uh, the, the people and the public are feeling and how we can assist in that. And it doesn't necessarily mean too much other than we can uh, provide them with the things that they need to feel comfortable. That is whether it be information or, or guidance, or again, like we did through the business, uh, with business as I, that we're helping them to find solutions to problems as well and at least connection. Could, could I just ask, sorry, Alex, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, when we're talking about people that we touch, um, could you give a couple of examples? Like what, is that, what does that actually mean? Is that, is that talking to a person first up at the customer centre and not getting a please press one for this department? Or what does it, what, in practice, what, what are a couple yeah. of examples? Yes, the example would be the one I gave you about my telephone call to to pay my rates and so basically mm. good answer i feel good about it and they gave the right answer in terms of you know um, only hardship and that sort of stuff so i felt you know i felt okay about it and also mm. got the right the right message came across so that that's that's an example yeah and and is is the idea as well that perhaps we might be needing to do outreach as in addition to just dealing with people mm. uh, yes. as, yeah yeah, I would have thought so. You know, and basically, even though that it's it'd be somewhat more costly, I think it's worthwhile thinking about in that small way of maybe slightly increasing the costs and getting the message across more humanely. Mm, mm. And we could always partner to do outreach um, uh, with uh, with NGOs and that sort of thing. Mm. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Alex and Ross. Uh, we'll um, we'll move on with uh, item ten point one is an exclusion of the public to consider uh, items uh, 11.1 and 11.2. Um, I do uh, need someone to move each of those motions. So Alex moved, seconded by Ross, and then uh, all in favour? That's carried. And then the next motion to go to the litigation update is moved by Alex, seconded by Ross, all in favour? 
that's carried. Now, we need to wait until our live stream has been stopped before we start the confidential item. So, uh, Anita, do your magic.